Um, there, there's uh, essentially um, two sets of case histories here that I think are just so, uh, so neat. Um, the first one I'll show you is a, um, um, a truly integrated case history. It's got gravity. It's got resistivity. It's got uh, drilling. Um, it's got seismic uh, refraction. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so all of those methods were necessary to, for, this, for this project to reach a, a definite conclusion. Okay, and I'll explain how. Um, and the other set of case histories I want to show you today are um, they're really just a very simple um, winter resistivity uh, uh, case history. And, uh, but what that is about is uh, essentially a waste containment problem, or four waste containment problems. Okay? So I, I, you know, this is where um, uh, one of the reasons where uh, uh, resistivity work is really useful in, in hydrological uh, studies, and one of the reasons why uh, hydrologists and, and uh, uh, other people working in pollution control often use uh, the resistivity method. Okay, so the first uh, the first case history uh, is coming from um, central Egypt, I think it is, um, or maybe it's Sudan, um, and the um, it has to do with the water resources of a uh, a basin to the west of the Nile River, um, and. Um, uh, so let's see. Yes, this is uh, this is southern or southern Sudan. I don't know. I don't know if this area, uh, this coasty area, I don't know whether it's in the new state of uh, South Sudan or uh, or whether it's in um, uh, Sudan proper still. Um, looks like it's close enough to Khartoum that it uh, is probably not in South Sudan. Uh, but it's uh, essentially one of these uh, sandy wastelands. Um, and uh, there was back in the '80s a big uh, World Bank project to investigate this area and see if it could be made agriculturally productive. So um, one of the things that you would have to do is, uh, you know, without building a uh, uh, many miles long uh, canal to bring water over from the Nile, and maybe that would involve pumping, which is too expensive. Um, you have to see if there's uh, if there's um, Water available in the in the ground, okay. So it's a groundwater exploration project. Uh, here's the um, uh, the layout. Uh, they did some pretty deep um, resistivity lines, and uh, each of these lines that are numbered from uh, one through sixteen, um, those are uh, uh, those are the resistivity lines. And, and notice that the resistivity lines are are lined up. Uh, along with the, the dots, which are gravity stations. And then there's also a few uh, seismic refraction spreads that were uh, laid out. Um, the line orientation was always perpendicular to the, uh, to the transect. Okay? And, and the reason for that was uh, the, uh, the 2D, um, the 2D uh, 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 cylindrical symmetry. That I that I've been talking about. Um, how do we analyze resistivity? We analyze it in one dimension. Okay, I mean we do have the power now uh, with the software from uh, multi-phase technologies. We can take resistivity data anywhere. You know, not just in a line. Uh, that line can be in any orientation relative to the strike and dip of the uh, of the local structures, and we can take uh, resistivity data over any. Um, you know, down holes and uh, and and uh, over an area. You know, not just on a line. And the multi-phase technology software can can handle that and model it. Okay. Uh, however, um, you know, this was from the days uh, before that. And um, maybe first, before you attempt a, a, some huge three D inversion, you want to. Um, you want to check and see, you know, what can the one D inversion do? Okay, and the one D inversion is what I'll show you on Friday in our lab session in class. 
and um, uh, and the reason that they they oriented these lines the way they did is that they wanted to put the resistivity, the expanding resistivity spread, okay, the expanding distances between the electrodes. They wanted to put those parallel, you know, along the strike direction of the local structures. And they had some idea, uh, probably from previous gravity and drilling, that the uh, the local structure was uh, kind of a basin deepening as you got to the west away from the Nile River. And so they um, uh, they decided that the uh, the most likely strike was uh, this kind of north-northeast direction. So each of those resistivity lines is uh, kind of trying to follow the strike, and that should make the structure that, that each line analyzes as one-dimensional as possible. See, if the, line, if the line crosses the strike, right, then you get those artifacts because you go on to more or less resistive terrains all of a sudden, you know, just with one electrode. And I showed you some of the, the kinks in the resistivity, uh, the, the apparent resistivity versus A-spacing curves that, that you can get with that. You know, when, when just one electrode goes across a fault, for instance. Uh, and if you follow the strike direction with your electrodes, then there's a lot less chance of, ha of, of, of that happening and a lot greater chance that you'll get a good model that matches reality uh, just from the one-dimensional analysis. So you want to try that first. Okay. All right. So... Um, <clears throat> So that's the uh, the setup, and and one of the one of the really important things uh, that that they had here was um, multiple techniques. Um, they wanted to use uh, uh, VES vertical electrical surveying, which is exactly what you guys have done with the mini res, okay, electrical resistivity uh, soundings. They wanted to use those to be able to assess the quality of the water, you know, before drilling it. Okay, if the water is too salty and too conductive, then it's not worth drilling because you can't irrigate with it. All right, uh, and and you know they were willing to irrigate and use salt tolerant varieties of crops and all that, and irrigate with brackish water. But if the water is truly salty, um, they then uh, then it, it wouldn't be worth doing anything. Um, and they already knew from previous development projects, you know, carried out over the last uh, century, that uh, you know, especially in the Sahara Desert, there's uh, most of the groundwater is this um, ice age uh, um, water that's too salty, uh, way too salty for any any productive use. Uh, you can get water out of the ground, but you have to desalinate it before you can do anything with it. So there's a lot of water under the Sahara, but it's uh, it's all about a million years old, and it's uh, it's been there long enough that uh, it's dissolved all the all the solutes in the uh, in the vicinity. So here's an example. This is uh, VES 13. It's sort of near the eastern side. Okay, uh, kind of close to the uh, Nile River, and. Um, <clears throat> This is one one diagram that uh, shows a bunch of different things. Okay, so uh, uh, one thing that's pretty simple is that uh, on this you know log log scale, and these were these were not winter array surveys; uh, they were uh, uh, Schlumberger array surveys. So um, a b over uh, over two is how you how you plot the spacing of a of a Schlumberger array. A b is the distance between the two. Um, current electrodes. Okay, so it actually doesn't. Uh, uh, when you when you calculate the, uh, let's see, probably useless to do this, but you've got the uh, uh, the current electrodes and then uh, the potential electrodes uh, in in between. Okay. And in uh, in a Schlumberger survey, it's a little more general than than uh, in a uh, uh, in a in a winter array. You don't have equal spacing between one of the uh, current electrodes and the near uh, potential electrode. You know, there, it isn't a constant a spacing. You can actually use any spacing you want, and when you calculate the apparent resistivity, um, you you do account for the difference in spacing. But the uh, uh, what you plot, 
against is just the distance between uh, the current electrodes. So that's uh, you know basically a to b is the way it uh, the way it's denoted. Okay, and so it's a log scale. You know here's uh, uh, you know like one and a half meters uh, uh, distance, and and the uh, parent resistivity there is um, uh, you know about uh, seven uh, ohm meters. And uh, there's a row apparent right up there, and then out here, uh, well, they didn't quite get to a thousand meters, one kilometer, but they got they got up to that looks like uh, five or six hundred meters of uh, of current electrode uh, separation. Okay, so here's the data points that they have, and. Um, uh, and and there can be uh, you know you can have the same A B spacing but you you uh, have two different uh, distances between the voltage electrodes and of course since it's a measurement even though you're adjusting for the uh, uh, the 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 C D uh, difference okay the C D distance um, your uh, uh, you won't necessarily get the same uh, parent resistivity so uh, in Schlumberger survey you can actually get Two different apparent resistivities at the same uh, AB spacing. Okay, and that's not anything unusual at all. Um, as you, because as you continue to open up AB, you uh, you also uh, have to occasionally open up uh, uh, C to D, the the potential electrodes. Okay, so uh, those are all the data points. All right, and um, and and they've also plotted on here. Um, the models, okay. So, so uh, uh, these blocky, uh, these blocky curves, okay. That there's a dashed one and there's a uh, um, there's a solid one. These blocky curves are uh, are models of uh, you know rock resistivity, just rho, not apparent resistivity, okay. And so, like here, the resistivity is seven, okay. It's uh, wait ten to the one. No, it's point seven. The resistivity is point seven, or is it one? No, it's, I'm sorry. It's one point eight. One point eight. Okay. Resistivity is one point eight ohm meters, and the um, and the layer is between depths of uh, what is that? Uh, Forty meters and uh, sixty meters, I think. Okay. So it's just plotting the uh, plotting the model directly on the uh, uh, directly on the data plot. You know, just to make it more efficient for that's one of the things you have to do sometimes when you're publishing a paper. Okay, you have to put a throw a whole bunch of different plots together, and and this is not a bad way to do it. Okay, uh, you can kind of see uh, you know there's a uh, a constant resistivity which is pretty close to the average resistivity of these very close apparent resistivities. Okay, and then it goes up right, which is causing this ramp up here, and then it goes down again. All right, and that's going to cause this uh, little bit of backtracking of the resistivity, where it decreases just slightly with increased uh, spacing. Okay, so that that decrease in resistivity is is not based on much, and you see the same thing in in Remy modeling, okay, uh, modeling dispersion curves. But um, you know, if you believe that the resistivity does decrease, then you have to put in this uh, this re this resistivity inversion, this low resistivity layer. Okay, and then it goes up again after that. So there's got to be a floor to that low resistivity layer, and that's going up to some more resisted bedrock. So so there's two models here, and and they're all they're plotted as uh, columns here. You know, against depth, not in not on a log scale. You know, this is depth on a on a on a linear uh, depth scale. Okay, and here are the resistivity values, right? So seven, and then forty four. And then there's two models. There's one that has a resistivity of the low resistivity layer. That's the dash one A, and that is um, uh, has a resistivity of seven. Okay. And then the layer below that is it is not even on the the uh, the scale here. It's a resistivity of two fifty. Okay. So that's up here somewhere. Okay. They didn't even uh, bother to plot that. Um, the other model, where is it different? Okay, it's um, it's uh, uh, got a thinner layer, but that layer has a much lower resistivity, one point eight. 
Okay. And um, uh, okay, so uh, that's really you know the thickness and resistivity of this of this shaded layer, this low resistivity layer. That's the only difference between these two models. Okay. Now, what does that represent? All right. We take a quick look at um, at our uh, um, at this chart here, um, and uh, let's see if I can get it more. Now well, it's almost readable here. All right, so we had uh, a resistivity of 1.8. Okay, so it's just barely above 10 to the zero, you know, meters. All right, so that's uh, clay with saline water. Um, maybe or maybe it's it's a little bit below uh, sandy clay. Maybe at the bottom end of sandy sandy clay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so that. Uh, uh, what what kind of aquifer would that be? Okay, I mean, first of all, if it has saline water, it's 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 not going to be a useful aquifer. Okay, it's uh, it's going to be you know with that low resistivity, it's it's too too low to be uh, um, uh, you know too salty to be of any use to anybody. You have to desalinate it. You know, spend a lot of money to get any water out of it. Um, I suppose in a sunny area like Sudan, you could use uh, solar desalination, but that's a really low volume technique. It's not enough. It's enough to you can get enough water to drink that way uh, with solar uh, solar stills, but you can't uh, you can't get enough water to uh, you know water cattle or grow any crops. Uh, okay, so um, now maybe maybe it could be on the bottom end of sand with saline water. Okay. So if it's clay with saline water, okay, it's sort of at the upper end. Um, so that's totally useless, right? Because if it's clay, you're not even going to be able to produce the water from that from that aquifer. Okay, I mean there's lots of water in the clay, but but the clay has essentially zero permeability. So you drill a well into it, and you'll get a few drops of water, and that's it. All right. Uh, if it's sandy clay. Same difference. Uh, you can't, you know, sandy clay is no has no more. Uh, I mean, mostly sand with some clay, you'll have some permeability, but mostly clay with some sand, you've got no, you you still got zero permeability effectively. So you can't you can't drill a well into that either. I mean, you can drill a well into it, but you won't get anything. So so there's a chance, right? Uh, if it's really if the resistivity is 1.8 uh, ohm meters, then uh, it could be sand with saline water. It's kind of on the low end of that, but uh, but still, so so with sand, you could produce the saline water out of a out of a well, but it's not going to be any good to you. All right. Uh, the other the other case. Uh, let's see. What was that? Um, uh, the resistivity is uh, seven. Okay. So what do we got here? Um, Resistivity of seven. That's like there. Uh, okay, that could be silt. Um, it could be. Um, um, it could be sand with. Um, uh, with uh, uh, with with saline water, but it would be a lot less saline than uh, than a, a resistivity of one point eight, and it's above the resistivity of clay, with uh, saline water. Uh, still could be still could be pretty clay. Um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these aquifers in in uh, in the Sahara have turned out to be pretty sandy. So uh, you know maybe it's uh, 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 maybe maybe at, at a resistivity of seven ohmmeters, <coughs> uh, it's uh, it still counts as sand with saline water, but um, uh, but not so saline. Okay. And so they 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 show in the paper. Uh, this is Van Overmeer, and again, um, they show in the paper that uh, uh, it would be right on the edge. You know, with a resistivity of seven ohm meters, it's right on the edge. It's brackish uh, and a little too conductive, a little too salty. But there are some crops that you could grow. Okay, so that that was the you know that left a, an economic possibility. All right. But uh, okay, so why why are we talking about two models here? Okay, well here's the thing: 
These models show equivalence, okay? Model A with barely usable water, model B with totally useless water, or maybe just clay, okay? Both of those models produce the same data, okay? This curve here that follows the data curve, okay? There are actually two curves there, but they overlay perfectly. Okay. You know, one curve is produced by A, one curve is produced by B. All right. You'll investigate this with uh, with our uh, resistivity data on uh, on Friday. But um, uh, so so what does this mean? This is uh, that means there's an indeterminacy in the data. The data don't you know the resistivity points alone. Do not tell you, and actually cannot tell you, cannot tell you which model is right. And these models are very different. They may be, you know, <clears throat> with uh, uh, with model A, you know, it would be worth uh, the World Bank loaning Sudan a uh, billion dollars to develop this area agriculturally, and and uh, you know the Sudanese would actually have a chance of paying it off. With model B. Uh, they're not going to be able to get a loan for a dollar, okay? Because the economics is 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 completely terrible. There's no economics, all right. So there's a billion dollar difference between the models, but no difference between absolutely no difference mathematically, theoretically, zero difference. It's not just a it's not just an uncertainty effect, not just a data effect. Absolutely no difference. Um, between the uh, the apparent resistivity versus uh, A B distances, those curves produced by the two models are precisely the same. Okay, that's equivalence in the equivalence problem in electrical modeling. Uh, Remy has uh, much the same equivalence problem. You can make a low velocity zone, and and if you can have a thick zone that's not very low velocity or a thin zone. That's very low velocity, and uh, and you get the same dispersion curve. Okay, so here's the equivalence problem for uh, um, for uh, uh, for resistivity and resistivity modeling. Okay, so so you know in in you know practically, theoretically, mathematically, computationally, no way to distinguish these models with resistivity data alone. Okay, so that's the, but that's my caveat. Okay, resistivity data alone. All right. So they, uh, you know, they're working on a on a grant application to the to the World Bank, right? And uh, and so they they make a they make a bunch of models that um, that have uh, uh, that show the the matches to resistivity, and they they're thinking positively here. Right, so there's 13 with the uh, with the brackish but still usable water uh, in sand at uh, at uh, seven ohm meters. Okay, and that puts the uh, the bedrock down here. Right, that's a relatively thick layer. Okay, here's a uh, uh, all right. So so this resistivity model predicts a depth of the um, of the bedrock of uh, more than 100 meters. Uh, I think it's about 120 meters there, 130 meters. Okay, depth of bedrock predicted by this model of 130 meters. All right. The other, uh, let's see, the other model, the alternative model, the equivalent model, predicts a depth of bedrock of 60 meters. Right there. What is that? Yeah, 60 or 70 meters. Okay. So the two models are distinguishable on their depth to bedrock, okay, and um, and so here's uh, this this uh, you know I'm I'm giving you the end of the story here. This turned out to be their final interpretation, okay. The depth to bedrock is seventy or eighty meters there on the same survey, and there's the you know one point five uh, uh, ohm meters uh, you know useless layer, okay. So they look at gravity, and uh, they look at uh, at the uh, uh, they look at gravity. They look at um, um, 
uh, they look at refraction, okay, and uh, here's their gravity data, and they had to model some, you know, they couldn't model it all as, as just, uh, uh, you know, basin thicknesses. Um, they had to model some deviation, some uh, density changes in the bedrock, uh, but they got uh, more like 70, 80 meters at this location, not 120 or 130 meters. Okay, so so that's you know that right there. Uh, that's the main thing I want you to understand from this whole class. Okay, sometimes only rarely can you get what you need to know out of one single technique. Okay. Um, and and you can and that that doesn't mean you have bad data. You can have great data. You can have accurate modeling. You know, uh, the problem, the equivalence problem, is only worse. You know, once you start using this is just a one D equivalence problem, right? Very simple, right? Once you start using uh, uh, MPT's code, right, with three D modeling, then there's equivalence problems all over the place, right? You've got to get constraints from some other technique. Okay, so here gravity and also it turned out seismic ref refraction were critical because uh, you know despite with the equivalence problem we were predicting two different depths for the uh, uh, for the bedrock from the uh, re resistivity work and that those that bedrock depth made all the difference in the economics of this of this development okay and so then gravity and seismic refraction supported the shallower depth and the lower quality water Okay, so here's their final model, constrained by uh, by drilling, um, and uh, uh, those are actually it looks like 15, but those are actually 1.5. The decimal point uh, got lost in reproduction. I can almost see it there. Um, so uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of very poor water here, and just a thin layer near the top of uh, of of poor but but maybe usable water. Okay, um, you know there. So here's that ice age water trapped down in the bottom of the basin, and um, and the Nile, of course, uh, you know, is supplying fresh water, especially when it floods, which is every year. So it supplies fresh water, which you know seeps into this into this uh, aquifer that overlies the saline aquifer. But that's all you have. There's no you know there's no more. I mean, they were hoping they'd have uh, you know this much more water, and it was it would be all good water, but they didn't find it. And I think I you know I haven't looked at Google Earth at this area, but I think it's still uh, entirely uh, undeveloped. Um, so uh, you know, not uh, this is not the news that the that that the World Bank or the people in Sudan who uh, who employed Van Overmeer and wanted to hear, but. Um, you know, better that you be honest uh, when you give them the results, um, right? I mean, I mean, uh, if they hadn't been careful, they would have said, "Okay, we can do the whole thing with electrical," and uh, and yeah, here's your result. You know, put in your application to the World Bank, and the World Bank would have loaned them a billion dollars. They would have uh, mobilized all these drill rigs, gone out there and drilled salt water, okay, and um, and the World Bank would probably then have asked for all the money back. <laughs> and that wouldn't have worked out very well at all. So, um, you know, sometimes it's better. Uh, sometimes you just have to uh, you have to disappoint your customer. Uh, here's a, a oh, uh, there is a third uh, uh, case history in here. Uh, this is kind of fun. Um, so, so we're on uh, Marajo Island, uh, which is. Uh, uh, has the uh, the distributaries of the Amazon River um, uh, going around it? So uh, what's that island going to? You know, it's in the mouth of the Amazon, right? What's the, what's that island going to be made out of? Sand, right? Clay, overbank deposits. It's going to be like Louisiana there, uh, except even more rain, right? This is a, this is in the Amazon uh, jungles. Okay, so the um, the precipitation is intense here, probably a hundred inches a year. Okay. But you've got the Atlantic Ocean, okay, right there, okay, and then all this fresh water pouring in, you know, around the Amazon, and then you know plenty of rain falling on the island. Okay, somebody wants to do an agricultural development, all right, and they if they uh, if they drill too deep and produce or or if they produce too much water, 
then suddenly they find you know that there's seawater coming into their wells, and then you got to stop irrigating. Okay, so you know how do you uh, how do you tell you know when how much you can pump? What's the size of the aquifer? And then you can calculate you know how quickly it's recharged every year and decide decide how much to pump. Okay. Um, so here's the uh, here's a bunch of uh, a 2D section made out of a bunch of 1D uh, resistivity sections. Okay. Uh, so uh, you know, and, and again they're called uh, vertical electrical surveys (VES), but it's the same resistivity technique that you used. And they're getting down to depths of uh, you know tens of meters here, 80 meters. Um, so they probably used um, you know maximum um, but uh, current electrode distances of maybe um, three or four hundred meters. So they had a little more wire than we did. All right. Um, okay. So they just took each uh, each survey and uh, and lined it up. Um, so there's the resistivity value um, in ohm meters, and um, and there's also some indications here of what the um, uh, what the uh, the formation is, you know, this is all you know very late quaternary, um, um, you know, channel sand channel and overbank delta deposits of the Amazon, um, and uh, and so there's another another you know uh, sounding, right? Just lining up the soundings. I'm, I'm sure if you process them all together in uh, um, in uh, uh, in the MPT uh, software, you get a little bit, you know, more accurate indication of you know the connections between between these various uh, uh, formation boundaries, but uh, this works pretty well, <clears throat> and uh, I think you can see it's highly vertically exaggerated, right? So that's one reason why you can just line up one-dimensional surveys, and and get uh, get a good result. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the uh, uh, some of the values here, all right, uh, and they drilled some of these, so they know they know kind of what's uh, what's down there. So uh, a value of forty-five ohm meters, right? Uh, let's go back up to our uh, our table here. Um, all right, forty-five is there, and um, so that's sand. That's at the bottom of sand with potable water, at the top of sand with uh, with saline water. So uh, not too saline, um, and uh, could be uh, could be clay. But the drilling showed that uh, um, that that wasn't uh, that wasn't clay. So there's this sand channel here. Uh, you know, it used to be a distributary of the of the Amazon. So this big wide channel. What is that like? Uh, 500, 700, 900. Yeah, it's like 400 meters wide, and uh, 30 meters deep at, at its deepest. Yeah, that's exactly what you would see as a distributary of the of the uh, of the Amazon, and it got filled with sand. Uh, but it's it's partly open to the uh, to the surface. So when rain falls on it, okay, the water goes into the rainwater. Fresh rain rainwater goes into this aquifer. Okay. And then it's it's floored by these clay formations, right? And the the resistivities are very low, 0.85 ohm meters, 1.25 ohm meters, 1.3 ohm meters, three uh, 3.5 ohm meters, if that's what that says. Okay. So um, and what are those? Uh, well, regardless of what the water is in those, those are those are clay overbank deposits. So they have uh, they have low resistivity just because they're clay. Okay, then there's this uh, well-known sand down here, which has been intruded with saline water. And look at the resistivities: 3.3, 4.7, 5.8, 4.2. You know, it's it's got basically ten times more salt. Uh, it's got seawater in it, ten times more salt than uh, um, than this aquifer here. Okay, that probably has a little clay in it, which explains the uh, uh, you know. I mean, with with really truly fresh water, right? You ought to have uh, resistivity of uh, let's see, sand. You know, clean sand with potable water ought to be about a hundred ohm meters, right? 
And you don't get that because uh, there's a little bit of clay. All right, so that that uh, that kind of explains that. All right, so the water in this aquifer is fresh. Okay, and so we have these electrical surveys that are defining the aquifers, the aquacludes or aquitards in between them, the clays, right? And then um, and then with resistivity, we can see you know which aquifers have uh, which sands have saline water in them, and which sands have have rainwater in them. Okay, so right here you get a uh, a cross section of the aquifer, and you can start you can start planning your your uh, your your production. Okay, so you know the volume of the aquifer, you know how limited it is, and and so you can you can decide. Okay, we can pump it this much before we'll get seawater intrusion from the edge of the island. Okay. And that's uh, um, uh, you know that's extremely valuable because then you can say all right you know with uh, I can feed this many cattle on that much water and and then you've got your whole business plan there all right uh, okay so uh, that's a nice uh, a nice little uh, a very tropical example and this is this kind of seawater intrusion versus fresh water falling on the ground as rain you know that's a that's a very typical tropical situation. All right. So um, now I want to go through the uh, four examples in uh, among others that are in this Staller and Rue paper. Uh, it's from a long time ago, but uh, you know pretty clear results and 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 very very simple technique. All right. So they did a. Uh, um, they took their their winter array. And they held it fixed. I can't remember where they used. Um, uh, I can't remember what what their a spacing was, but they took one a spacing, and they um, and they just went around and they they just got point measurements of the apparent resistivity at that one a spacing. Okay, so uh, you know they didn't open up their their arrays. They just. Uh, um, they just uh, produced, you know. They just uh, went for uh, mapping. You know, they wanted as many uh, as many um, as many locations as they could get. Okay, and this I think is a uh, uh, a mine dump <coughs> um, that was uh, leaking um, uh, leaking acid water, and acid water is more conductive, uh, less resistive than uh, fresh water. So there was, uh, you know, they they went into these areas up here. Uh, you know, the the direction of, of groundwater flow was generally uh, uh, westward, which is down. You know, in the in the diagram, there's a north arrow there. Okay, and so you know these same measurements, the same a spacing. I mean, sometimes they are really large. I don't know about that one, but you can see they're in the thousands here. So you know, fresh water. Uh, mostly very uh, resistive. Uh, it gets, over here, there's some still, you know, fairly uh, uh, lower values, but still pretty high in the hundreds. Okay, and over here in the hundreds, in the hundreds, over here in the in the hundreds, down here in the hundreds. Okay, you get uh, uh, you know, so kind of in the groundwater flow downstream of the waste dump, of the mine dump, I think it was. And uh, it's just a few hundred, 304, 366, 459. Uh, in this area, that's kind of attracting a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, bad water. Uh, you know, 144, 122. You know, so you can see a contrast. You know, 526 versus 221, 3200 versus 144. Okay, all through here. Um, you know, all through the discharge area. You know, less than two hundred. Okay, uh, over here, uh, still less than three hundred, and then you know, two seventy nine to eleven eighty seven. Okay, big differences. So basically, what they achieved here was a mapping of the conductive waste plume. All right, and you know, if you um, um, uh, now now, uh, so you could you could make a plan here and say, all right. Uh, you know, if I'll I'll put extraction wells and I'll treat the water 
you know, say from here to here, I'll put a line of extraction wells, okay? Um, and, and I don't really need, you know, maybe I'll put a couple of monitoring wells in, but that's all I would need. Um, now, the, uh, uh, the EPA won't let you do that. Um, you have to put in a whole grid of monitoring wells, okay? And that's expensive, and, and you got to get those wells sampled, you know, like every month, okay? So, um, you know, this shows promise. I mean, if we could get the, in a situation like this, if you get the EPA to, um, you know, relax the regulation a bit, then geophysically, right, it was this easy, right, you could come up with a much more equivalent, much more efficient program of, uh, of monitoring and, and extraction, okay? At least, uh, at least, you know, the geophysics here, you know, which was cheap to do, right? I mean, this probably took uh, four or five days, for them to, to put in this, I don't know what it is, 100, uh, you know, one A spacing arrays. You know, it, you can imagine how long that would take. Not, not too long. So, you know, it, probably, uh, probably $20,000, right, was the total contract. Uh, you, and you could hardly drill one, one monitoring well for that, okay, even at that time. So um, uh, they had... Uh, um, you know, they had a way of geophysically defining the plume, and, and that could make the extraction and monitoring program much more efficient. Now, the EPA wouldn't let them, okay? And, and after I show you a few more examples, you'll see why, okay? Now, here's, here's one that's not quite so good, uh, but um, it's, uh, it had similar success, and I think I'm going to have to zoom in um, a lot to see it. So, <clears throat> okay, there's the, uh, uh, again, we have, a, we have a, a conductive waste contaminating the groundwater, all right? And when we're in the waste plume, uh, you know, we're under 200. When we're outside of the waste plume, we're over 200, okay? So not quite as good as, as this case, you know, where it goes from thousands to hundreds in the plume. But still, some some definition, right? Less than a hundred, we're in the plume. Over uh, uh, over two hundred, I mean, less than two hundred, we're in the plume. Over two hundred, we're we're out of the plume. Okay. So, uh, for instance, the uh, the waste had only propagated this far, right? Even though the groundwater direction flow direction is uh, to the bottom right. All right, 300, 200, 177. Okay. So so not as definite, but still we could see it. Okay. Same thing, you know, hundreds of points, um, maybe 100 points gotten, you know, with a constant A spacing. Okay, and these are just, we're just plotting up the apparent resistivities, right? So you make a contour map of the apparent resistivities and you got it. Okay. All right, well, here's, here's uh, a couple of cases that, that didn't work, all right? So here's a, uh, a fly ash dump. Um, and there are salts in fly ash, and I think that's what they were hoping for. But really, the contaminant here is, uh, uh, you know, what else comes out of uh, fly ash? Where you get all these nasty organic compounds. Okay, uh, this is ash from uh, um, from burning coal. You get heavy metals. You get organic compounds, and and you know the the standards, you know, especially drinking water standards for those. I mean, we're talking parts per billion parts per million. You know, the organic compounds like TCE, the heavy metals like, um, like chromium or, or copper, um, you know, parts per million is at the upper level. Some of the standards are down to the part per billion level. Okay, uh, lead, I think, is in the parts per million. Uh, chromium is in the parts per billion level that's thought to be carcinogenic. Okay. Um, so uh, now in this one, they were not, they were not able to, um, uh, you know, so not only did they, did they have, okay, the, the fly ash was, you know, definitely gave lower resistivities, but then they had this brackish groundwater. The lowest resistivity is actually over here, where they didn't think the, uh, the groundwater was contaminated. So the geophysics here did not give a straight answer, okay? And part of the problem is just that the, the pollutants they were most concerned about were not conductive. And also, even if they were conductive, um, you know, the, the, the
the concern is, uh, you know, in the parts per billion level, right? And so if you have one part per billion of the contaminant, you know, that's only going to change the uh, change the resistivity by a part per billion. You'll never measure that. It's totally impossible. Okay. So and and also part of the problem was they they just didn't make enough enough measurements. And there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of natural variability too. Just the the geology of the site was diverse enough that uh, they really had no hope of defining that plume. And even if they defined the plume, you know, when you're talking parts per billion, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Here's another example. Uh, this is a, a, I think a, a purely organic. Uh, this is probably uh, a place where that where you know in decades past, uh, um, you know, solvents had been dumped into a into a pit. Okay, and then and so solvents are are in those you know parts per million parts per billion uh, hazard, and they also they just don't affect. You know, we're not talking about any kind of conductive. Uh, uh, Conductive, uh, 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 conductive uh, uh, effluent here. Uh, now you can see, uh, you know, three hundred, two nineteen, one forty nine, two eighty. All right, and there's a contaminated well here that had, you know, well over the amounts of of the solvents uh, necessary. But then uh, you come over here. There's an uncontaminated well. Because of the direction of groundwater flow, and you know, right around that are measurements of 238, 205. Okay, lower resistivities. So obviously, the resistivity of the groundwater, the resistivity of the ground, has nothing to do with the level of contamination. So this one was a total failure, and they did a few measurements, obviously, and and quit. You know, once they observed that the uncontaminated well was. Uh, uh, was lower resistivity than the contaminated well? They said, "Well, we can't do anything here." Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, and you can see they probably did one day's work here, right? I think you can get all those points, you know, at a constant small a spacing in one day. So one day's work, and then they had to give up. Uh, but they got a paper out of it, right? That's very good. Um, and so that's why that's why the EPA hasn't recognized geophysics yet as uh, uh, for mapping plumes because it's it's you know it's a, it's effective in in area it mostly in certain areas let's see um, okay I mean it can be effective so you know I but but could you really describe the criteria? You know, and make uh, and, and and make regulations that would say when the resistivity is good enough, definite enough, that that you could use it to plan your uh, your monitoring program. That's the that's the tough part. And uh, uh, you know, it's obviously been several decades since, and and geophysicists have not been able to convince the EPA that that's uh, that they could write those regulations that way. Um, so uh, I think I think we're at the stage here where you know if you're lucky and the contaminant, uh, the only contaminant that you have is very uh, conductive, and you have uh, you know a, a background which is uh, which which shows you know this uh, striking difference in 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 apparent resistivities, then uh, then you could use it to plan your extraction program, and that's that's how. Um, you know, so so we can't make the monitoring programs any cheaper. We can make the extraction programs more efficient using geophysics, and that's that's kind of how it's uh, how it's proceeded since then. Um, and and why a lot of these uh, you know environmental companies do have an electrical geophysicist on staff, or they, or or you know if you go to work for one of them, you'll be you'll be expected to uh, uh, you know. To know enough about electrical geophysics that you could start start using it at their uh, at their sites. All right. Um, any questions about uh, about these? Really uh, classic case histories here. <laughs>